Uh, but good evening and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Peggy Kurtz and I'm the leader of Rockland Sierra Club and one of the leaders of the Rockland Water Coalition. We are here this evening to discuss the contamination of our drinking water and consumer products with PFAS chemicals. We'll hear about the risks posed by these chemicals, but we'll also hear some good news about the growing movement to regulate PFAS more strictly and even to ban widespread use of these chemicals. Before we begin, we wanna take a moment to acknowledge the tragic mass shooting that just happened in Buffalo and the lives that were lost. The racist violence that we saw in Buffalo was prevalent in other deeply embedded systemic ways in our, throughout our society, including in environmental regulation. So as we discuss our topic this evening, Let's keep in mind that racial and environmental justice are very much a part of the work that we're discussing tonight, as you'll hear. Moving on, in Rockland County, I live in Rockland County. We were notified 18 months ago that our drinking water is contaminated with toxic PFAS chemicals. Since that notification, we as citizens, as uh, living here as residents, we have educated ourselves and we've come to understand the seriousness and the magnitude of the contamination of our communities and of our bodies with PFAS chemicals. These chemicals are toxic, virtually indestructible and ubiquitous. The phrase that we've heard over and over right from the beginning from experts is that like lead, there are no known safe levels of PFAS. Years ago, we were able to make huge strides toward reducing our exposure to lead and asbestos by stopping, <coughs> sorry, by stopping their widespread use in products. In order to deal with this contamination, we must do the same, turn the faucet off, stop the production of PFAS as much as possible. As you'll hear tonight, as more scientific information continues to emerge, about the health impacts of PFAS, there is suddenly a real movement to do just that, to ban these chemicals and to regulate them in, in drinking, to make our, our drinking water safe. Before we begin, I wanna thank our sponsors for their work on this issue, Clean and Healthy New York, Environmental Advocates New York, Natural Resources Defense Council, and Sierra Club Atlantic Chapter. These four, group, these four groups have been in the forefront together with some other groups in New York State in crafting a strategy to address this problem. I wanna particularly thank the three legislators who are joining us here this evening, Assembly Members Ken Zabrowski and Pat Fahey and State Senator Elijah Reichlin Melnick for their work on this issue. <coughs> I also want to mention Rockland Sierra Club we meet monthly and we focus on water issues and on climate action. And you can learn more about us at rocklandsierraclub.org. I also wanna thank our co-sponsors who have helped us to get out the word about this program and who have worked with us throughout Food and Water Watch, again, Natural Resources Defense Council, Rockland Coalition to End the New Jim Crow, the Rockland Water Coalition, Rosa for Rockland, Rockland League of Women Voters, and West Branch Conservation Association. In terms of logistics, please put your questions into the chat. We'll hold all the questions till the end until all the speakers on our panel have spoken. And we'll start now by hearing from three different state legislators who have worked on this issue. It's my pleasure to introduce first our assembly member, uh, Ken Zabrowski. I'm very proud that our two state legislators are going to be um, among the first to introduce legislation. Uh, Ken Zabrowski has already introduced legislation that will go a long way toward banning PFAS. His district is the 96th Assembly District, which covers much of Rockland County. We really wanna thank him for his work on this issue. Assemblyman Zabrowski. Uh, can you, are you able to unmute? Yeah, I think, uh, you yes. can you hear me now? Great. Yes, we can. Well, Thanks so much, Peggy, and, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you here. And um, I just want to, you know, start off by augmenting some of what Peggy just said. Um, you know, here in Rockland County, in my district, we uh, ha have to put in very expensive 
filters, have ratepayers spend millions of dollars for filters in order to filter out of our filter out of our drinking water from these dangerous chemicals. Well, how counterintuitive is it then that we have to spend money to filter our water, yet we allow these chemicals to continue to be used in in products, products that are um, not only used for um, manufacturing and those type of things, but products that are actually used each and every day by people. So it's my pleasure to work with a lot of the advocates here to develop legislation so that we uh, phase out and stop the use of these chemicals because we shouldn't be just filtering out our drinking water. We should stop the drinking water from being contaminated. So thanks so much for all the people on here tonight for your collaboration. We'll continue working towards that goal. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for all your work. Most of all. Um, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Assemblywoman Pat Fahey from the 109th Assembly District. And she has also introduced legislation, a ban on PFAS in apparel. Uh, Assemblymember Pat Fahey, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. Um, Maybe we'll go next to State Senator Elijah Reichlin Melnick and I'll come back to Pat Fahey. I wanna introduce State Senator Elijah Reichlin Melnick of the 38th Senate District. Uh, he is about to introduce legislation in the Senate. Um, can you, are you able to unmute yourself? I, I am, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Well, Peggy, thank you so much. And it's, it's really good to be here with you all this evening. Um, I had another commitment, but I wanted to make sure to, to log on and to show my support for this critical uh, issue that we're dealing with. Uh, I am getting ready, uh, as was mentioned, to, to working with my good friend and partner, Assemblyman Ken Zabrowski, uh, to introduce legislation to phase out the use of PFAS in so many of these products that are sold around New York State. And one way or another, we know these chemicals get into our water, they get into our ground, and then they stay there forever. They're not called forever chemicals for nothing. And we are having to spend a lot of money with uh, the, the Suez water and people that have wells and everybody else on their consumer side, trying to filter them out. And we really should be looking at the source and cutting off the source before they get into our water to begin with. Um, so I'm committed to working with all of the clean water advocates, all of the environmental advocates, getting ready to, to try to make progress and have New York be a, a state where we do not need to worry what the test is gonna show because we can have confidence that we will have clean water when we turn on our taps. And I hope we'll get there. And I think that this legislation will be a start. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for your work, most of all. Okay, Assemblywoman, Assembly Member Pat Fahey, are you in the house? And if so, are you able to? Okay, so maybe we'll move, we'll move on for right now. Uh, next, we have uh, Rob Hayes, who is the Director of Clean Water New York uh, for Environmental Advocates New York. Uh, Rob? Thank you so much, Peggy, and great to be with you all tonight. It is phenomenal to see over 100 people on this Zoom line, and I think that really speaks to both people's interest in protecting public health and protecting clean water, um, and the commitment to making sure that our environment and our products are kind of free from toxic chemicals that could make us sick. So thank you all for being here tonight. I think we have a phenomenal program lined up, some amazing speakers, um, and hope, hope you learn a lot from this program. Um, Peggy asked me to kind of set the stage for tonight and to kick things off. Um, and, and she already shared, I think, some you know, great information to set up the risks that PFAS pose to public health. Uh, you know, PFAS is one of the greatest threats to public health that we've faced in a very long time. Uh, we can't see these chemicals, we can't smell these chemicals, we can't taste these chemicals, but they are exceptionally dangerous. And they are everywhere and they are in our blood. Uh, and we have seen significant contamination events across the state from these chemicals from Hoosick Falls to Newburgh to Rockland County to Long Island. Um, and so when we think about the scale of the PFAS problem, it can seem very daunting and it can seem, you know, we can ask ourselves, is it worth trying to address this issue, trying to change this issue um, and protect public health? Um, and hopefully what you'll take away tonight is that the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you're going to hear stories tonight about successful community organizing, about successful policy campaigns to change laws and regulations. 
And hopefully what you take away from tonight is that organizing works and advocacy works and that when people come together and join each other in community, uh, we can change policy and we can protect public health and clean water and the health of our, our friends and loved ones. Um, and part of what you'll hear tonight is some of those great successes we've had in New York over the last several years because of the amazing organizing and leadership from impacted communities. Uh, New York is really setting uh, you know, national leadership on this issue, but there's still so much more to do and even more opportunities to continue you know, making sure that we're setting the precedent for other states and the federal government to address this issue and make sure that we're putting in place the most health protective standards and laws and regulations possible. Um, so hopefully to kind of sum up, hopefully you emerge from tonight, both with more education about what PFAS is and why it's dangerous, but also that you feel inspired to kind of take action and help in these campaigns to get these chemicals out of our water and out of our products. Uh, so with that, thanks so much. You'll be hearing from me a little later on the drinking water side, but I'll turn it back over to Peggy. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Rasil Sayas. Uh, Rasil is a- Peggy, yes. can I pause you for a second? I am trying sure. to find uh, Assemblywoman Fahey in the meeting and I'm not seeing her name. So I'm, I know you're here, Assemblywoman, I'm looking for you. And if you can send me a chat in the Zoom, I, can, I think I should be able to admit you, up to promote you up to be a speaker. So sorry for the pause. No, no. Uh, Assemblywoman Faye, I want to suggest maybe send it in the chat, send something. Oh, um, is it I'm not sure. uh, maybe um, Michalina Kuleza? Kuleza? Yes. It's, uh, look for the name uh, Michalina Kuleza. K-U-L-E-S-Z-A. All right, just a do, moment. Do, do you see it? Ring, ring. Hi, I think you can now hear me. Hello? Yes, yes, I, yes. my video is still um, stopped. Yeah, I am just really one second. sorry. Uh, Michalina is one of my staff members and I don't, I'm on my laptop, so I have no idea why I am signed <laughs> into her name. You should, you should be able to turn on your camera now. Let's see. Oh boy. Okay. Oh, <laughs> there okay. we are. There we go. So okay. sorry. Okay. okay. It's, it's well, okay. Pat Fahey. I'm really sorry. I've been <laughs> on the whole time, although I haven't really heard the last couple of speakers because I've been frantically calling everybody. Uh, my apologies. I guess I never go a day or two without running into some type of uh, Zoom problem two years later uh, or two years into COVID yet still running into uh, to Zoom issues. So my apologies. Um, thank you for uh, not giving up on me and, uh, and letting me in. Um, I, as you mentioned at the very beginning of this, Peggy, I am the very, very proud sponsor um, of the uh, PFAS and apparel bill with it's um, A7063A. And I sponsored that with um, Senator Hoyleman, uh, uh, Brad Hoyleman in the Senate and certainly co-sponsored by the, um, uh, uh, both the previous speakers, um, uh, including uh, Ken Zabrowski. And, uh, and I really appreciate uh, as well as uh, um, the senator who just spoke, um, I know I'm going to goof this up, Reichlin. Um, it, so anyway, we are, uh, this is the, I've done a couple of other bills and one of the most recent ones was I did the one a couple of years ago that uh, banned PFAS and food um, packaging, um, which uh, has really already begun to help change the system. Uh, as you, uh, you know, as you've already heard so many speak and big kudos to Rockland County on all the work that they've done as well as clean and healthy environmental advocates, Sierra Club and so many more. Um, but I, the thing that most desert, disturbs me about um, PFAS uh, chemicals is that they are as labeled forever chemicals and that they do not break down naturally, that they are found to accumulate in our bodies and that we are repeatedly told uh, that there's no level that is safe. And the, and the part about this that bothers me too, as well, because you can say, okay, it's clothing. What if it's outerwear? What if it's this? So 
you know, a raincoat or some other type of rain resistant. What bothers me is that in washing those clothes, that's it, even more chemicals seeping into our water systems. So it's not just the wearing of these clothes, it is the washing of the clothes. And um, as I know you have on your websites and have so many others have, have stated as well, um, that the, the Silent Spring Institute uh, has found that um, uh, roughly 60% of children's clothing, especially when it's labeled waterproof or stain resistant, is showing um, uh, the, the PFAS substances. And, and that part is also disturbing. Uh, again, I know many who are on this uh, call are from Rockland County or live in Rockland County, and it's just disturbing on so many levels. I know you're trying to keep all your speakers uh, to be brief, uh, but many other states are attempting to do this as well. And um, I just got good news earlier tonight. We thought this bill might be on the floor, but I'm, I'm hoping it will be tomorrow. So we are really trying to move this bill this year. And just as we saw, it's taken a couple of years with food packaging. And I don't know about you, but I still go to some places that still have plastic food packaging. Um, we are making progress and it is changing. And I don't need to tell anyone here when New York uh, makes these changes, it does have a positive ripple effect across the country because uh, manufacturers, uh, you know, we are the New York City in particular is, is still the heart of the, the garment industry and are still critical to the garment industry. So when we make changes here, it can have a very, very positive impact. And, and I should say we already have good players in this in this field as well. We know that there's a number of national chains who have already um, begun to ban the use of PFAS chemicals in their products. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of them, Zara and Uniqlo and um, uh, Reebok, Adidas, Levi's, H&M. So there are good players out there. Uh, and uh, we do have some exceptions in the bill, of course, uh, for those uh, with, um, uh, when it is clothing for extreme weather, uh, we recognize that. And um, and just as we've done this with uh, PFAS in, in foam with firefighting, uh, we can make this change here. I, I really think we can do this. It does take work. It will take some time, um, <coughs> but it will absolutely make a difference. So um, thank you again for not giving up on me and sorry if I had the wrong uh, sign in name, my apologies. Happy to take questions if appropriate, but not sure that's appropriate. I know you have a healthy, uh, a very yeah, long agenda. Right. We, thank we you. Leave. Thank you. Thank you so much. And most of all, thank you for your work. We're keeping the questions until the, holding the questions until the end. Okay. So, until after, right. the, after the speakers. And yes, as Assembly Member Fahey was saying, other states are watching. Some of them are waiting to see what we do. And, you know, California and New York are going to set the pace. Colorado just passed legislation also. So each of the states is, there's real momentum, which is very exciting. And, and thank you. Thank you so much. Agreed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for all the yeah. help on this. It's, it's needed. Yeah. Can I add one more quick thing? I, sure. I don't want to hijack your agenda. I also carry a bill um, that has a tidal wave of opposition hitting it right now. It's called Right to Repair. Uh, and um, that will really uh, make a massive difference with electronic waste if we can repair our phones, our appliances, our laptops, and more. Um, it's Bill 7006, just another great environmental bill. Just want to get on the radar screen. Thank you for those 30 extra seconds. <laughs> and thank you. I can hear your passion. <laughs> and I share it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, so now let's hear next from um, a research scientist, uh, Dr. Rasil Sayas. She, Rasil is a research support specialist at the New York State Water Resources Institute at Cornell. Her background is in environmental health and environmental engineering, and her work focuses on water quality issues, including lead, PFAS, and other emerging contaminants. Rasil, can you unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my screen just fine? We can. Uh, can uh, Sarah can maybe remove this spotlight so so that it, we won't. I don't know. 
not sure. Okay, why don't you, why don't you get started? Great, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to be briefly introducing the topic of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or as we know it as PFAS. Uh, I'm going to be talking about their sources, their risk of exposure, their health effects, and some ways of mitigating their presence in drinking water. I thought it might be interesting to go back in time to see how, it, how the beginnings of PFAS, these manufacturing substances, as it turns out, uh, it all started as an accident. In 1938, um, an American chemist by the name of Roy Plunkett was working for DuPont, uh, researching new refrigerants to find alternative ones to those that poisoned food industry workers and people in their homes. So during one of his experiments, he uh, produced this white powder polymer that he found to be extremely heat resistant and uh, chemically stable. And this was later named, and, and as we know it now, as Teflon. Um, Teflon was actually used in the Manhattan Project for development of the atomic bomb and kept a secret during the World War II, but later patented by DuPont in 1945. Fast forward a few years later, Plunkett received um, a medal from the city of Philadelphia uh, for his um, invention for, I quote, promoting the comfort, welfare, and happiness of humankind. And the attendees of that event were given muffin tins lined with Teflon. And, you know, Teflon was then used immensely in consumer and industrial products. And then there was extreme significant expansion of the use of PFAS in various industries uh, in the 1960s, 70s, even, even till today. So what are PFAS? There are currently more than 5,000 chemicals that fit under that umbrella, and it is ever expanding. They are a group that is um, manufactured. It not, it's not naturally present in the environment. They have these really very strong chlorine-fluorine bonds that make them extremely stable and resistant to most degradation processes. In fact, that bond is the strongest covalent bond in organic chemistry. And what you see in that um, in the rectangle is this uh, hydrophobic or water repellent tail, and it's completely saturated with this fluorine. <clears throat> but on the head, there's this. Um, the functional group that is actually hydrophilic. So it has these both these properties that make it extremely unique and very beneficial for the industry. This is just an example of PFOA or as known as also C8. Now, the problem with PFAS is that they bioaccumulate or they build up and in the environment, they persist. And that's why we all know them right now or have known them as um, forever chemicals. Okay, so what are some of the sources of PFAS? And you'll find here, like the list that I have here is things that we use almost every day. Uh, there are consumer products that we're very familiar with, such as nonstick cookware and utensils. As mentioned previously, it's found in food packaging, it's in polishes, cleaning detergents, and it's also um, found in stain resistant and waterproof clothing, textiles, and paper. But other, other products that contain it could, are more industrial products, such as fire extinguishing foams, hydraulic fluids, mist suppressants, lubricating oils and chemicals and, and electronics. And it's not just when we use these chemicals that we are exposed to them, but the manufacturers or the chemical production facilities that, that are making them, they are discharging their waste into the environment. And they're also emitting um, fumes into the air and all of it ends up um, in, uh, you know, in the soil and the water and the air. And these industries can be chrome plating, electronic plastics, you name it. But also when we dispose of all these products into, um, into just regular waste, and it ends up in a landfill, there's um, the landfill leachate, which is like the liquid that just passes through and picks up all this, all these chemicals and all these um, uh, the, 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 the byproducts from all these ways that also contains um, high concentrations of PFAS. So how are we as people exposed to PFAS sources which is by using or in the indirect exposure, uh, exposure to these PFAS containing products. But I think more importantly is when we are drinking water or consuming fish or shellfish that is contaminating with PFAS, that's a really big route of exposure. Consuming meat, milk, and eggs of livestock that is raised on PFAS contaminated land 
and also consuming food that comes in contact with PFAS containing products, such as when we use these um, grease resistant papers for food wrapping. And, um, you know, these PFAS, they actually like stick around in our bodies for a long time, depending on what kind of PFAS, but they can stay for, for um, a few dozen um, months to a few dozen years. And usually the long chain uh, PFAS are the ones that have more of the CF bonds, they stay longer. And what does it do? Like when we actually, when PFAS is in our bodies, the research has been suggesting to a high level of certainty that exposure to PFAS may lead to the following, increased cholesterol levels, changes in liver enzymes, which means there could be inflammation or even damage to the liver. And we know that the liver is such an important um, organ. There's an increased risk of kidney cancer, increased risk of testicular cancer, increased risk of thyroid disease. Um, and for pregnant women, increased risk of high blood pressure or preeclampsia, and then delayed mammary gland development, um, which reduces also and an reduction in response to vaccines and lower birth weight in unborn children. So we as people, how can we know if our water is contaminated with PFAS? Uh, what people can do is that they can, um, they can look for their consumer confidence report and that um, I'll get into it in a second, but every water utility uh, in New York state, at least that I know, has to have an annual report where it reports on every contaminant that it measured, even if it became, even if the results came below the detection level, but they're supposed to have that list. And if a utility serves more than 100,000 people, I put in a link there where um, the, the consumer confidence report is actually public. So you can just go and, uh, and, and look for those utilities. However, if it is, um, if your utility serves under 100,000, then you should uh, be able to contact your Department of Health or your um, local water utility and ask, and ask for that. In addition, you can, directly contact your water utility to see which PFAS they have measured and what the results were. And because we have maximum contaminant levels or MCLs for PFOA and PFAS, you will know that they would at least have had to measure uh, those two and they would have had to have results for those two. But if say you wanna know personally if your water is contaminated or not, you can test your tap water for PFAS your, not yourself, but collecting, but doing that action yourself by doing the following. This is just a step-by-step -step list. I thought I'd share it. You don't have to, we don't have to go through it, but if you wanted to have your water tested, you have to have the samples tested by an EPA certified lab. To find this EPA certified lab online, I put in this, um, this link right here, which is the Department of Health Search New York for accredited environmental labs. And then you have to basically choose potable water. We're not looking for it in soil or anything else. And then click on uh, the PFAS compounds you're interested in. And then it will show you which labs in your area or in New York um, uh, are able to measure that for you. They'll send you a kit. You will fill out the form and the sample and then return it to them. It's not free. But this is if somebody wants to uh, be vigilant and proactive and, and to the steps themselves. And if you're not limited to New York, you can just not filter by, by state. And if you say you find out that your uh, drinking water is contaminated with PFAS through one of those three that I mentioned, it's important to be proactive. And, I'm, and I can't wait to hear all the success stories that, um, that are coming after me but contact your local and state elected officials to communicate the PFAS results and um, urge action on the matter. Ideally, you would want to, uh, whatever um, solution is gonna happen, you'd not wanna be the one responsible for paying for the, for the cleanup yourself. So it'd be great if the water utility itself decided to install a system-wide filtration system. But if, you, if somebody isn't seeing any action and they wanna be, uh, they want to know how they can protect their family without having to go through all that. Um, activate the carbon filtration. I have, sorry, uh, they're in bold here. Activate carbon and reverse osmosis are known to be extremely effective at removing PFAS. And I have put here the link for you to find uh, uh, products that, that are 
certified at removing those chemicals. Um, anion exchange is also an option, but it's there's currently no product certification, but I just thought I'd mention it. And obviously, uh, you know, all that we're mentioning here is all these filters are only stop gap, gap measures. Uh, our main goal should be stopping PFAS from being released into the environment at the source. Uh, so, so these um, uh, facilities and co companies that are producing PFAS and, and uh, releasing them should be more uh, vigilant and proactive and have um, and treat the waste stream and emissions before they are released into the environment, but also conduct, but also be able to come up with products that are non PFAS. So alternatives are safe uh, for the public and the environment. That's it for me. I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will have time at the end for questions. So next we're going to hear from about three different communities. I'm going to start very briefly by talking about Rockland because I know there are many people on from Rockland County and people I imagine would like a, an update on Rockland County. So I'll speak very briefly about it. Uh, so in Rockland County, nearly all of our water sources are affected including Suez, Nyack, and Suffern water companies. Nearly all of Suez's water sources are contaminated as well. Eight different PFAS chem, there are nine to 10,000 PFAS chemicals in all. Eight different, but only 29, which can be specifically detected. Eight different PFAS chemicals have been identified so far in Rockland's, in Suez's water, but Keep in mind that Suez has tested only for less than half the chemicals, which can be specifically detected. They will be required going forward to test for all of the chemicals. So we will at least know and all the detectable for, for 23 um, chemicals. <coughs> it means that there could be more PFAS chemicals that we don't know about yet. And that requirement is as a result of the work uh, legislation that was passed through the work of Environmental Advocates New York and other groups last year. Uh, Suez is now required, uh, so far filtration systems have been installed at two sites and three more are under construction. They need to clean up 20 more wells, all wells that are not in compliance that are exceeding the state drinking water standards will be filtered as they are required by law in addition to some that are close to exceeding the drinking water standards. That most likely still leaves many sources, many of the sources for Suez's water with no filtration for, for PFAS chemicals. Work has been delayed due to supply chain issues and what they're calling lack of local permitting resources. Unfortunately, this delay means that half or more of the work will be delayed to the fall of 2023. So we will have gone three years without full filtration. And we still won't be at full filtration because as I mentioned, they won't be filtering the water from all the wells. <coughs> Private well owners have not been notified as far as I know by the county about the problem, or at least most of them have not been notified. It's a little bit more complicated, but that's the basic story. <laughs> the Rockland Water Coalition and Sierra Club have worked on all of this with a frustratingly little response on the local level. Uh, ultimately, I think it began to occur to all of us that really the root of, we should be attacking the root of the problem and turning off the sources of this, this contamination. And at that point, we began to work with this co wonderful coalition of groups working on state action on, um, on PFAS. And we hope that all of you will join us wherever you live. This isn't just a Rockland issue as you'll hear and as you heard from Rocio, this really affects all of us. It's ubiquitous, it's endemic. It's not just in our drinking water, it's in thousands of consumer products. So next we're gonna hear from two other communities that have been severely impacted. We'll hear first from Kyle Conway, from Newburgh. He's the vice president of the Newburgh Highland Falls branch of NAACP. 
Uh, Kyle, can you unmute yourself? Good evening. I'm Kyle Conway, as just introduced. So Newburgh has had an interesting experience with the PFAS chemical. Uh, um, people in Newburgh have tested five times above the average rate for five types of um, PFAS chemical. The situation that happened in 2016, it was discovered that the uh, PFAS chemical was into the drinking water source, which was uh, Washington Lake. Uh, immediately, there was uh, Newburgh tap into uh, New York City's aqueduct, and that's where they're currently um, getting water now. And there's been a, and it's been attempted to be addressed in terms of rectifying their local water source, our local water source. The currently we are. So that was in 2016, excuse me. There was also a set of testing that took place to try to see exactly who was impacted. There was testing, but, and there was data uh, revealed, but nothing was done with the data. So currently what we're doing, um, the NAACP and other environmental justice groups are working together to make sure people are tested. We're testing for PFAS chemical. We're also testing for lead. We're trying to see exactly who has this chemical still in their system. People who are people today are not drinking the same water source. So, in this sense, we have to focus on the people who've lived um, in Newburgh for a little while. When uh, the data is retrieved, and the goal is to do something with the data to ensure that the government protects its people. The reason the chemical was entered into water sources because Stewart National Airport or your Stewart Air National Guard, excuse me, was utilizing um, fire extinguishers. And inside that, the extinguishers, the chemical side is PFAS. And it so happened they've been using it for decades. So it's no, it's hard to register how long this chemicals has been in the system, in the in drinking water system and within the people system. So the goal is to obtain the data, see how many people are impacted. And when we have the data, we can go to our local, uh, local state and national um, elected officials and ask for our people not to be left behind. These situations where you have the Air National Guard impact in the local drinking source isn't just um, isolated by in Newburgh. This is this is well over a hundred um, oh this is this is over a hundred sites throughout the United States. This is a perpetual and I love the word ubiquitous um, mishap. Now accidents happen that's fine but the Newburgh Highland Falls branch of NAACP, the NAACP, we, we need people to be protected. The government is here for the people. They're put there by the people. There is no, there is no substitute for clean water. There isn't a substitute for clean air. And this is a basic human right. Comfort is expensive. Poor health is expensive. There are, we don't have scarcity in this country. We can find other sources to make sure people are protected. And what's going on in Newburgh, uh, the, the testing that's going on is part of a seven city um, site, seven city site study, excuse me. And Newburgh and Hoosick Falls, both in New York state are part of that testing. Um, so you have a situation where from um, the, the government impacted the people and you have another situation where um, a corporation was utilizing the chemical and then the, the waste from the factory was dumped into the local water so drink, local drinking water source. So it is, Newburgh is going to be uh, an example of what community action looks like, how, how David can beat Goliath, how when the people unite, 
there they will be results. And the people must be protected at all times. The government needs to ensure it doesn't leave any citizens behind. We do not leave any soldiers behind, thankfully. And we need the same type of energy when it comes to our citizens. So that's what's going on in Newburgh. And we're in the middle of um, the process and we're gonna see what's gonna happen. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And no problem. Everything. Okay. So next we're gonna hear from another community uh, from Maureen Hackett. Maureen is founder of the PFOA Project New York. She's on the leadership committee for the National PFAS Contamination Coalition. And she's on the community action panel for the Hoosick Falls PFAS multi-study, uh, multi-site study and for the uh, community action panel for the National Academy of Sciences Physician Guidance on PFAS. Um, Maureen? Thanks, Peggy. Um, thank you, all the groups that put this together and uh, allowing me to participate. I want to say a special thank you to the legislators on the call. Um, I don't know that I have to go through the whole history of Hoosick Falls. I'm fairly certain everybody's heard about us by now as we were the tip of the spear. Maureen, um, tell us the basic, basic how, how it happened. How it, okay, yeah. um, but thank you to the legislators for continuing to listen to the advocates and the community members because we're the ones that know, we're the ones that face it, we're the ones living it. Um, and so thank you for the continued push to ban these chemicals. Um, briefly, uh, the Hoosick Falls story started in August of 2014 um, after a private citizen did uh, his own sampling. Uh, it was reported to the state and county in August of 2014. We weren't told to stop drinking our water until the end of November 2015 by EPA. Um, so we got extra exposed and it was a whole nightmare. Um, in January, um, DEC, everything started to, to sort of act after that. Um, and a lot was because our community banded together and said, we're not gonna take this. So uh, I think we were kind of instrumental in starting the whole process of recognition and awareness of PFAS. And we've continued to this day. Um, after we had, uh, blood Maureen, testing. Maureen, can I introduce, uh, interrupt you for one second? Sure. So can you talk about the factory that, you know, and how, how it's gotten into the community? Sure. So we are now the, we hate being first on name list, but it was from, we have three federal Superfund sites now for PFOA. And they were two single bing plants and an old Honeywell plant. Uh, we have two additional state sites and five more P sites, which are potential that they're investigating now. So in this four mile area in this little tiny town, we could have up to 10, 10 sites and it's all industrial. And the kicker is even though we have federal Superfund site statuses, we're still dealing with emissions of the replacement chemicals, which has not yet been addressed. Um, we know this from testing that, that was done not long ago. Um, and hence the problem with PFAS. We regulate two, we regulate 10, we regulate 20, and there's 12,000. And, you know, will we ever catch up? So we know these other chemicals we're still having to deal with. So getting rid of it in any way we, that we can, whether it's through legislation and, and banning it in apparel and consumer products, every step helps because these bioaccumulate. Um, we had two rounds of blood testing here. Uh, and so we know that our levels are severe. Um, my family and I tested in some of the highest levels in the area. And that's when I really started delving into research and started my Twitter page, which I thought was gonna be finite. And six years later, I'm still going. Um, and I've worked with these fine people on this call, as a person, as a, I'm not a toxicologist or an epidemiologist or a researcher, I'm just a mom that was advocating. Um, and I wormed my way into these five people's hearts um, who now allow me to have a voice in legislation 
Um, so very grateful, that, but, but that's the kind of thing a community member can do. If you're not comfortable with speaking or talking, you can write letters, you can make phone calls. Um, so advocacy does work. And I think that's one thing Music Falls has proven over these last seven, geez, almost eight years now. Um, we're tiny, we're 3,500 people in the village and we made a difference. So um, as far as the health impacts, if you want to think back to those slides, we had a community survey um, done. It's about 430 people. Out of those 430 people or so, um, about 230 reported thyroid disease, 71 with ulcerative colitis, 31 with kidney cancer. I, I mean, the, and that was a community survey. The results did not jive with what New York State came out with. Um, but the, so the health effects can be severe, particularly for our children as we learn through health studies, how they're exposed, they're being born pre-polluted. And we also know that now from blood testing in some of the babies that have been done here too. Um, so the health effects are devastating. We don't get to live with not worrying about our health anymore ever for our families. That's how serious this, this issue is and how toxic these chemicals are. Um, so as far as affecting change, some of us have continued down the road to work you know, however we can with advocates and uh, legislators and groups and Sierra Club and EANY um, and inserted ourselves into, into making these changes as best as we can and hopefully as fast as possible. Uh, as we know, we're still dealing with this contamination. Uh, it's been, we've been looking for new wells for five years um, and we just had a proposed remediation uh, package put through DEC just recently. And it's going, it's going to be another few years before it, but we've been going, working on a, a GAC filter, a dual filtration system in the village for years now. And as far as well owners go, we've had, the contamination is so widespread between here and Petersburg and North Bennington. We're all in this one little area. Um, there's about 800 well owners that now have poets. So it's, it's a pretty extensive contamination patch. Um, but if anybody ever has questions about community activism or anything, um, feel free to reach out. I'm sure Peggy has, or will give out, you know, contact info, or um, you can follow me on my Twitter page at PFOA Project New York. Um, and we'll just keep plugging away at it as a community and as advocates and as moms and dads and families for the health of our children. That's, it's the bottom line that we have to stop being exposed to these toxic chemicals. Um, so I hope everybody can um, join in to that call and reach out to your representatives and keep pushing this because this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon if we're only addressing two or four or 10 or 20 at a time as they find more and more about uh, the health effects of this stuff, which has gotten worse since we found it. PFOA is now, EPA is looking to call it a carcinogen. So in the last five years or so, since this really started coming into news, the effects are worse. They're finding the health effects are worse. So we need to really keep plugging away to protect our families. Um, I think that's it, is that good, Peggy? Yeah, that was great. And what I want to emphasize also is that the, at least one of these factories is still operating. Is that both correct? are both both, are, yeah. both Cinco Bay factories yeah. are still operating. Yeah. And it's something else where yeah. you know the ongoing contamination from the replacement chemicals, and and we're not getting anywhere with that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for all of your work. Uh, Maureen Thanks, has been, is really a powerhouse. <laughs> <laughs> she really is. Okay, uh, next we're going to hear from uh, two environmental professionals who are, we're going to hear about the momentum in New York State and how you can help. First, we'll hear from Bobby Wilding on the topic of legislation. Bobby Wilding is executive director and co-founder of Clean and Healthy New York. She's been engaged in advocacy for environmental health for 25 years. And her work is focused on turning off the tap of toxic chemicals flowing into our communities and addressing the legacy of harm caused by those that are already here. Um, addressing PFAS as a class, so not just one by one, 
but as a class, all of them is a critical component of clean and healthy New York's work. Bobby? Thanks so much, Peggy. And thanks everybody. Before you mute, can, I, can you hear me, Peggy? Am I coming yes, through okay? Yes, yes, yes. Great. So um, a lot of my intro slide, which I'm about to share, uh, has been covered by others, but I just think it's worth uh, just pausing for a moment um, to, do you guys see my slide uh, on the second page? You see my, do you see my, there we go. Yes, Great. yes, we do. Yep. All right. So, um, you know, we've been talking about where we find PFAS. And I think that it really, what, what Peggy just said about Clean and Healthy New York's work is really, um, really true. We started our jobs uh, thinking about turning off the tap uh, 15, 16 years ago, thinking about one chemical at a time, bisphenol A in baby products, right? In baby bottles, not even just all baby products. Um, and as we've uh, expanded and learned from the response of industry, um, we've really come to recognize that we have to address uh, the largest bite as possible uh, around toxic chemicals and not waiting for comprehensive proof because the, the chemical industry is often trying to get us to argue over each single molecule. And that's not what protects people. What protects people is looking at the evidence and understanding the way that similar structures have similar effects on our bodies. Um, and that's why we now have definitions in New York State of PFAS that are 9,000 different chemical structures. And we believe that it's vital that we take action on those 9,000 structures all at once, which is well beyond what we're able to test for in drinking water at this time. Um, because well, otherwise, what we do is we end up chasing those molecules, right? What are those alternatives that, are, that Lorene was talking about, right? How do we make sure that the solutions we're finding aren't just solutions to PFOA and PFOS, right, but are actually solutions to the fluorinated chemistry that is plaguing us. And one of the things that I'll note, there was a question that came in that we can address later was about nonstick pans. And a lot of times, if you see a pan that says it's PFOA or PFOS free, you cannot count on that being actually free of all fluorinated chemicals. So it's really important to understand that industry is trying very hard to confuse us so that they can continue to use these toxic chemistries without any hindrance. Um, but we are standing up, we are making a difference. You've heard from communities that are making a difference. And in New York, you can see on my slide, we've got uh, firefighters standing in a sea of foam, which is what they end up doing. It's behind the, the, the not symbol um, when they're fighting big chemical fires. That foam is made out of fluorinated compounds. That's why we banned PFAS and firefighting foam in New York state. One of the first in the nation to do so pushing the boundaries and pushing industry to come up with safer chemistries. Um, and we know from the work of our colleagues that there are in fact inherently safer chemistries out there that can be used to fight fires. Um, we've also, New York as uh, Assemblywoman Fahey was uh, mentioning uh, her bill that is now law to ban uh, PFAS in food packaging. These are steps that we've taken, um, but now we have to go beyond those single categories and take much broader action. And we're really uh, excited that uh, Assemblyman Zabrowski and Senator Reichlin Melnick are sponsoring legislation to be much more expansive to address this entire class of chemicals in all sorts of different places, in the nonstick or uh, the, the stain proof clothing, in the floor polishes and the carpet treatments and the cleaning products and our dental floss and the mica that goes into our personal care products and those nonstick coatings that are PFOA free but are still PFAS and the PFAS that's now in our household paint to make it easier to wash the walls and the ski wax and the furniture. It, there are, these are all part of the policy that um, they are advancing um, and I'm super excited that it addresses the um, intentionally added chemicals, but also the chemicals that come along from the manufacturing process. Um, and we are not alone. Um, in the United States today, uh, there are uh, currently, just to address PFAS, pending legislation, 206 current policies in 31 states. And you can see that here. And already this year, Colorado has passed a ban on eight product categories. Uh, this is just this new year. Uh, you've got Vermont, who's going to be doing medical monitoring, not only of PFAS, but of other chemicals. 
You've got uh, Maine that has passed a law that doesn't allow PFAS to be spread in sludge, and it has compensation for farmers to make sure that those, you may have seen the stories of farmers who had to shut down because they had spread sewage waste as biosolids on their land, and that was enough to contaminate the animals that they were raising. And they had to shut down organic farmers trying to do everything right. Uh, the extent of the contamination is widespread and states are taking action. So in New York, um, we have a number of bills, and this is just a sampling of New York's policies that are moving right now. Um, the, there's a bill that would require manufacturers to res be responsible for the end of the life of their carpets. And that includes a ban on PFAS because as we move to a more recyclable, recycling circular economy, it's vital that it be non-toxic, that we don't just cycle toxics over and over and over and poison our children for decades on end. Um, that's passed both houses. Uh, that, was, those were that bill was sponsored by Senator Kavanaugh and Assemblyman Engelbright. Um, on the floor in both houses, as um, Assemblywoman Fahey was mentioning just a little bit ago, the bill to ban PFAS in apparel. That's very exciting. It is uh, crucial. Uh, every time people go and test for um, uh, PFAS in products, they find them in sports bras, in yoga pants, in children's clothes, um, not to mention places that you might anticipate finding them. Um, like things that are actually marketed as being uh, stain proof or uh, stain repellent. Uh, we've also got a bill in both houses to address safe personal care and cosmetics. Um, and this is actually an A print in the Senate um, that's uh, brought forward by Senator Rivera and Assemblyman Gottfried. And um, that goes beyond just PFAS. It covers a whole host of, of chemicals to be banned, including things like uh, um, uh, uh, phthalates and um, parabens and, and others, and also will give us more information about what's hiding in uh, unintentionally added chemicals. And then uh, as uh, we've talked about this broader bill that New York has pending, that should have a bill print number at any moment, um, and both Senator Reichlin Melnick and Assemblymember Zabrowski have a bill that would um, uh, set up forth a, a process for the state to get rid of all PFAS. We think that taking action on those product categories is going to move us faster further, given the current situation at the Department of Environmental Conservation and the challenges they have with not having enough staff. But we're really excited that this year, New York can once again lead the way. We know that the ban on food packaging was one of the reasons that Burger King came out finally and said that they were going to ban PFAS in their packaging globally, right? We, New York is a driver for so many changes that happen across the country. And particularly when we pick up uh, changes in New York with changes in just even a couple of other states, it changes the market completely for the United States. So together we can move these policies. We can get PFAS out of the thing coming into our homes. We can stop it from going down our drains as we wash our apparel, as we rinse off our personal care products down the drain. Um, we can make a difference for communities, for everybody across the state and really have an impact nationally. And because all of these bans on products sold in New York, um, it doesn't matter where they're made. So whether it's made here in New York or it's made in China, uh, they can't sell it here. It changes the whole supply chain all the way across the globe. So we hope that you will take uh, action and join us. I will drop some phone numbers into the, um, uh, into the chat where you can call legislators and we'll also be circulating some action alerts after the event. So thank you so much, Peggy, and to everybody who's been here and sharing their stories tonight. Um, we really look forward to making a difference this year. I, I, thank you so much. Yes, we really look forward to making a difference this year. I want to emphasize that. Um, okay, next we're going to hear from Rob Hayes, who is the Director of Clean Water for Environmental Advocates New York. Rob? Great. Thanks, Peggy. And I will share my screen now. Let's see, pull that up. All right, Peggy, am I good with the slides? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, hello again, y'all. Um, hope you've really been enjoying this program. I know I have. 
I'm here to talk about regulating PFAS in drinking water. You heard a lot of amazing info from Bobby about all the work that's being done to get these chemicals out of our products and stop them from getting into our drinking water in the first place. But I'm here to talk about when these chemicals do get into our drinking water, how can we address that? How can we make sure that every single New Yorker has safe, clean drinking water and that no one is exposed to toxic chemicals that could make them sick when they turn on the tap? Um, so to start with just a little history, uh, let's see if I can, ah, uh, there we go. Um, to start with a little history about PFAS and drinking water regulation in New York, um, as we heard from Lorreen and Kyle, a lot of you know the PFAS issue in drinking water really came to light around 2014, 2015, uh, when we had the water crises in Hoosick Falls and Newburgh and across Long Island. Um, it's really important to note that before 2014, 2015, uh, no PFAS chemicals were regulated in drinking water. Water utilities did not have to test for these chemicals. They did not have to clean up these chemicals if they were tested for. Uh, nobody had any idea what PFAS were or that they might be exposed to these really dangerous chemicals. That all changes in 2015. Um, and thanks to the amazing advocacy of the impacted community, some of which you've heard from tonight, uh, New York took a groundbreaking step in 2020 and established what are known as maximum contaminant levels for two PFAS chemicals, PFOA and PFOS. These are the two most well-known PFAS. They're the ones that were found in Hoosick Falls and Newburgh. Um, and these were the first that New York decided to regulate. Uh, the state established some of the lowest maximum contaminant levels in the country for PFOA and PFOS at a level of 10 parts per trillion for each of them. Um, so what do these maximum contaminant levels mean? They mean that every single public water system across the state has to test for these two chemicals in their drinking water. And that if the PFOA or PFOS levels in their drinking water are above that MCL, the water utility has to notify their customers directly via mail uh, you get a specific notice, you know, in your mailbox, and they are required to clean up the contamination that is present. That might mean installing filtration technology. It might mean finding a different water source, but something has to be done by that water utility to reduce the public exposure and make sure that they're not exposed to levels of these chemicals that could make people sick. Um, and on the slide in the right, uh, you know, it's a slide that from a Department of Health presentation back in October of 2018, and it gives us just a quick snapshot about which water utilities so far have exceeded these new drinking water standards for PFOA and PFOS. And the map might be a little small, but what you really need to take away from this is that one, PFAS are being found all over New York in our drinking water, but especially in the Hudson Valley and Long Island. Uh, we've had over 150 water utilities exceed these standards so far. Uh, we expect that even more will be coming through this year and the years to come. Um, but the amazing thing is each of those 150 communities are communities that now have cleaner or will soon have cleaner water because of the new standards that communities fought for, that communities advocated around. It was a long fight, a five-year fight, but it happened and it's having real results on the ground today. Um, but what's important to note is that, you know, we've been talking about how there are 9,000 PFAS chemicals out there. We were only regulating two of them in drinking water. What's unfortunate is we can only currently test for 29 individual PFAS in drinking water using EPA approved methods. So our means of tackling these chemicals in drinking water is really circumscribed right now. But that still means there's a lot that we can do to protect people from other PFAS that could be in their water. Uh, and that's why over the last several years, environmental advocates and many of our partners advocated for a bill that would dramatically expand the number of PFAS that are regulated in our drinking water. And in December of last year, Governor Hochul signed a bill that we got past the legislature that says the Department of Health has to regulate 23 more PFAS in our water. This was groundbreaking. No other state is regulating this many PFAS chemicals in drinking water. The most that another state is regulating right now is seven, maybe eight PFAS. We're, we're about to regulate almost three times that number. Um, so it's a huge step forward for New York. It sets up a real potential for us to play a leadership role on addressing PFAS in drinking water. Um, but it's not just enough that we you know, decide we're gonna regulate these chemicals in our drinking water. 
it really matters what levels we set that govern public notification and govern cleanup. Because uh, it doesn't matter so much if we're testing our water, if ultimately the public doesn't learn about contamination that's there, and if that contamination kind of remains in place and people continue to be exposed to it. Um, so over the last several months, we have been advocating to make sure that New York enacts the lowest, most health protective standards for all of these PFAS uh, in drinking water. And uh, just this month, actually a couple of weeks ago, the State Drinking Water Quality Council, which is an advisory body, uh, came up with their recommendations for the levels that New York should set for these 23 PFAS in our drinking water. And that's what that chart uh, to the right kind of explains. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, what the heck does that chart mean? There's a lot of letters in there that I have no idea what they mean. Um, but it's pretty easy to understand once we kind of quickly walk through it. Um, so the Department of Health is, and the Drinking Water Quality Council are proposing to take kind of two different approaches here. Their position is that some PFAS in drinking water are more dangerous than others. Now, we disagree with that approach, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But what the Department of Health is proposing is that for a subset of these PFAS, the ones in those two rows at the top of that chart, we're going to establish those maximum contaminant levels for those PFAS. That's going to require statewide testing. It's going to require public notification and cleanup if those PFAS are, are found at those levels in your water. What the Department of Health then said is, for all the other PFAS in those last two rows in the chart that they argue aren't posed, don't pose as immediate a danger to human health, we're going to establish notification levels for those chemicals. Notification levels are kind of a regulatory step below MCLs. Notification levels also say every water utility has to test for these chemicals in their water, and the public has to be notified if there's an exceedance, but cleanup is optional for that water utility. The kind of goal behind notification levels is we don't want another Hoosick Falls type crisis to happen again. We don't want people that are in the dark about their water. So as the state you know, considers setting MCLs for more chemicals, let's start the testing now, let's start the public notification now. So if a community wants to be proactive and install treatment on their own or address this problem on their own, they have the full knowledge to be able to do so. So that, that kind of defines what, what um, notification levels are. Um, in terms of the levels that the Drinking Water Quality Council recommended, these are among the lowest levels in the nation for these chemicals. Uh, and they are much lower than what the Department of Health was initially considering. We have been, I think, very effective so far at lowering these standards over the last couple of months. Another example of how advocacy on this issue really makes a difference. Um, but that's not to say that we're entirely happy with this proposal and that we think it should be accepted kind of uh, as is. You know, we want the lowest, most health protective standards on PFAS possible. That means as close to two parts per trillion as possible. So in many cases, the council's recommendations are still far too high to fully protect public health. There will still be New Yorkers who have PFAS in their water and they won't get a letter in the mail under the council's proposal. And there will be dangerous contamination across the state that won't be cleaned up if uh, the governor's administration adopts what the council recommended. Um, so we're continuing to advocate for stronger standards over the next couple of months to really make sure that we set New York, New York up for national leadership on this issue. It's technologically feasible to set lower levels, and it is morally and, and environmentally necessary to set those lower levels because you deserve to know the full extent of PFAS in your water. You deserve to have any dangerous contamination in your water cleaned up. Um, and so what do the next steps look like for this advocacy? Uh, so this is all happening very quickly, getting these new PFAS standards in place. Uh, in about one month, the governor's administration is going to decide, are they going to accept the council's recommendations, or are they going to strengthen those proposals to more fully protect New Yorkers' health? So we have a really critical one-month time period here to influence the governor's administration to get them to do the right thing on this issue. Um, and then you know, they're going to then publish draft regulations. We'll have another shot uh, at trying to influence these standards. We expect it all to be finalized by the end of this year. Um, but this is the time and the moment to really make your voice heard on this issue. I'm going to be dropping in the chat after this presentation an action alert that you can take. So you can email the governor's administration and say, I want to get PFAS out of my drinking water. 
And if you want to get more involved in this campaign, if you want to help organize your community to speak out more, to participate in more ways, my contact information is there. I'm sure Peggy can share it later. Feel free to reach out. We are always happy to connect with more New Yorkers that want to get involved on this issue. Uh, so with that, I'll stop sharing and we'll turn it back over to Peggy. Okay. I really want to thank you very much. I want to emphasize that all of what Rob was just talking about was really due in large part to Rob's work and the work of, of Environmental Advocates New York who first passed legislation last year. And it's been very exciting to be part of, part of that movement to, to get this regulation. So now we have time for your questions. Um, the first question I want to ask is really to Rob. Uh, because it's directly related to what you were just talking about. How do these regulations affect those on individual, I guess the, the ask questions are referred to um, private wells? That's a fantastic question. And unfortunately, the regulations that are forthcoming only apply to public water systems and only apply to New Yorkers that are on public water. So private well owners won't face any testing requirements under these new regulations. Now, what we have seen across the state with that being said, is that the Department of Environmental Conservation will often use these PFAS standards as a benchmark for when PFAS should be cleaned up in private wells. So we've seen in other communities where they've had drinking water contamination and there are private well owners near that source of contamination, we've seen the Department of Environmental Conservation go out, do testing in those private wells, and they'll actually pay for treatment to be installed on your private well if you're above 10 parts per trillion for PFOA or PFOS. Now, they don't do anything if you have other PFAS in your drinking water that New York is now considering regulating, which is why it's so important to get the strongest possible standards in place now for public water systems, because that will likely mean, you know, the stronger standards we can get now, the more protections that private well owners will have and the more treatment technology that will get installed if you have those chemicals in your water. Okay. One other question for you briefly also is, can you please explain the importance of regulating PFAS as a class? I think Laureen kind of touched on it, with a, uh, but why is it not a valid, pro why is it not sufficient to regulate one by one? Chemical it's, by chemical, yeah. It's, it's a fantastic question. And, and you know there are a number of different answers here. I think we're, what we're seeing is that with every PFAS being studied, we are seeing that they harm human health, every single one of them. Uh, and so we shouldn't take decades to try and you know, address each of these chemicals one by one because it would take hundreds of years to address all the PFAS chemicals that are out there. Um, if we take the approach and the assumption that these chemicals are dangerous as a class, that there is no known safe level of exposure to these chemicals, then it means that we have to regulate them at the lowest, most health protective levels in our drinking water and to ban them entirely from our products. And hopefully as science and technology advances, we'll be able to test for more PFAS in our water and we'll go beyond the 23 PFAS that we're currently about to regulate. Uh, hopefully we can find a way to test for all 9,000 of those PFAS and set a drinking water standard for all of them. Um, that's still in the future, but with the technology we have now, we're trying to push New York uh, in the direction of regulating as many PFAS as we can in water right now. Thank you, thank you. Okay, the next question I think is for Rasil. Um, I understand that in the US, the approach of, to regulation of chemicals is basically that chemicals are considered innocent until proven guilty. That is that chemicals are introduced first and pulled only once it's been proven that the chemicals are unsafe. I also understand that the EU has taken a different approach and that chemicals are regulated in Europe with a more of a cautionary approach. Can you please explain? Russell, this Ex question. Explain, yeah. the, explain the difference between, between why the US. In, yeah, that the, it, it, is that correct? US, that in the US that they're question. sort of put out first and then- Yeah, Europe yeah. tends to be a bit more strict about what they release into the environment, much more than the US. I don't, know why other than uh, you know I feel like the industry is pretty powerful around here I feel like even if they know of maybe Rob wants to interject I feel <laughs> but um, even if, if even if they've done the studies and they know it's not really safe they sort of keep pushing it and hiding it and making it proprietary uh, until it it sort of gets out um, 
I, I, I don't know the reason between why the U.S. isn't more stringent, but I have a feeling it's a bunch of factors uh, that, that, that play into that. Okay. Yeah, Bobby, probably. Go ahead, Go ahead Bobby. Yeah, okay. I, I'd, be, yeah. I'd be happy to tackle that uh, at least a little bit. Um, one of the things that I think it's important to understand about the European Union is that they provide health care for all of their uh, residents. And so when you take a public health approach to uh, managing those costs, you want to make sure that people are not getting sick unnecessarily. And so the framework that they adopted in Europe, which is still problematic and deeply uh, disrupted by the chemical industry, the petrochemical industry globally, um, but they have taken a more product protective stance. In, in the United States, we did create a system um, under the Toxic Substances Control Act that basically assumed that you had to understand each chemical individually and you had to uh, assess it. And um, one of the, the critical components is that it, you can't harm the, the relevant industry. Um, so there are even worse uh, pieces in the way that our laws were constructed. Um, the American Chemistry Council is incredibly powerful at the federal level. We collectively have a lot of power here in New York um, in, in a way that we can shape national policy um, through our actions at the state level. Um, and, and frankly, it's why I, uh, having been involved in policy at lots of levels, love doing work here in New York because we can we can make changes here that affect uh, the the country and uh, and sort of overcome some of those challenges that we have from the federal legislation and federal framing for those laws. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a question: the notification levels where they're required to inform but not clean up will only help those who that can afford to respond financially, in other words, to, to take steps to protect themselves. So we continue, we continue to promote environmental justice to those who have greater exposure and less financial. I guess the question is, how can we continue to promote environmental injustice to those who have greater exposure and less financial means to access to clean water? So I guess that question is for you, Rob, about the notification levels. Like, how do they help people who don't have the financial means to install a system or buy, you know, buy water that's safer, that, that kind of thing? And then maybe yeah, that's yeah. that's a that's a great question. Um, and I think one thing that's important to note is even though the notification levels don't require cleanup by your water utility, you can still advocate to have your water utility install that filtration technology and to clean up your water. Uh, so individual property owners or homeowners don't have to install filtration themselves. Uh, you know, Rocio was talking about how, you know, we need to address this problem at the system-wide level, at the water utility level. People shouldn't have to install individual treatment on their homes if they're already served by a public water system. Um, so one, one solution is you can still advocate, even when those notification levels are exceeded, for your water utility to take action, and ultimately for your state leaders to take action, and ultimately transition those notification levels into cleanup standards, into MCLs. You know, that's what we hope for, for all 23 and even more of these PFAS. All of these PFAS should be covered by a combined maximum contaminant level. We're pushing the state in that direction. We haven't gotten them there yet, but that's where this work is going forward. I also wanna make one other quick note too about kind of the costs and the finances of all this. Um, there are a number of ways that utilities can help pay for these systems that don't put the burden of the cost on their ratepayers. The best way is when they can hold a polluter accountable for the cost. And we've seen this happen in a number of different communities. But where a polluter isn't easily identifiable, New York State has actually invested in an enormous and historic amount of grant funding to helping communities install treatment technology. In fact, Governor Hochul just a couple of weeks ago announced $200 million in grants to you know, a couple dozen communities across the state, I think, to help them get PFAS and other toxic chemicals out of their water. Um, so the good news is there is financing available to get these systems in place by water utilities. Uh, so the cost isn't being passed on. Uh, to individual New Yorkers. Yeah, I, I just want to add that I think the notification levels are sort of a first step to uh, requiring cleanup. When communities become aware that their, their water is contaminated, 
questions are there, people are going to start to ask more questions and, and hopefully to demand action. Okay, another uh, question is bottled water a safer substitute in most communities than drinking water from your tap? Um, I don't know, maybe that's for Rustio. I, I don't whoever wants to answer. Yeah, that sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, drink bottled water. Uh, what a, a contentious subject. Because you basically, I don't think that in the US you're able to know the source of your bottled water. I don't think there are any regulations to your bottled water. At that point, you're also getting introduced to a lot of microplastics. <laughs> so um, you, I, I, it, I guess it would depend on, on, on your water source, your current water source, your tap water, and your, your level of comfort, because sometimes you have no choice because your, your, your community has contaminated drinking water and you can't drink from the tap. So it is, it's, it's a little tricky. Um, it's because then you're exposed to other, you know, other contaminants that you don't know, you don't know about of market pollutants, such as microplastics. Uh, if you, I feel like if you have no choice, then, and, and uh, it's a dire situation, it's an emergency, then yeah, bottled water definitely makes more sense until your utility or lets you know it's cleaned up or switched over. Uh, but yeah, this is, these are my thoughts on, on the issue. I don't know if anybody okay. has any ideas. <laughs> Okay. Peggy, if I may, yes. um, for anybody that wants to look it up, Consumer Reports did uh, a study on bottled water and did find mm -hmm. varying amounts of PFAS in, in various uh, producers. Um, so if you want to look up that, that study that Consumer Reports did, you should be able to Google it easily. And it lists the producers of the water and which tested for PFAS. Yeah, and if, thank you for re, for um, saying that. Yes, um, Consumer Reports has published a lot of good work on PFAS and, and, and very specific, such as filtration systems also and bottled water. Um, and another good source is Environmental Working Group. Both of them have done a lot. Of, so, um, okay. Uh, Russell, can you also talk about the research which has shown that PFAS exposure in, impairs the immune system? So that would be, there's a direct connection with COVID, the immune response to COVID or to the vaccines. Yeah, so I'm not a toxicologist. I can just remember that some of the things that I've read, I don't think there's enough data yet to see how, um, how, uh, how specifically um, getting exposed to PFAS and then having lower immunity to something like COVID. I um, I remember watching um, this brief documentary about um, a, 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 a baby who was exposed to PFAS, had really high levels, and this baby isn't responding to vaccines the same, uh, has lower immunity, that sort of stuff. So I don't know specifically about COVID, but I know that if uh, I know that it impairs, you know, the immune system and has, and then um, especially for young kids or for babies that they have. Uh, less ability than to to fight off infections or to uh, to be receptive to vaccines. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next question. Maybe this is for Bobby um, about EPA standards. What what's happening or not happening on the federal level? Um, do we need legislation, perhaps federal legislation, to push the process faster in the same way that we did with the drinking water standards in in New York? Um, when it yeah. comes to uh, PFAS in products, I don't think there's a whole lot going on. Um, if it comes, there's there there is a lot of effort going on at the EPA to address um, PFAS in different ways. I am not as focused there in terms of their regulatory actions. I don't know, Rob, if you've been paying attention to EPA, but unfortunately, I don't want to give people misinformation. Yeah, I can just mention quickly on the drinking water side at EPA, they are unbelievably behind where we are in New York. We still do not have a federal drinking water standard for even either PFOA or PFOS. Uh, these ones that we've now had standard in places uh, for years. Um, so, you know, the federal government is way behind where we are on this issue. And hopefully, you know, New York kind of leading the way, pushing things in the right direction. 
sends the signal to Washington to kind of follow our lead and put in place the most uh, health protective standards at the national level. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, somebody writes, uh, PFAS is still being spread in contaminated sewage sludge on food crop fields in New York State. Does, I don't know, Rob or Bobby, do either of you want to address that? I mean, I think and, this and is maybe what... ex explain what the issue very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so when we have PFAS in uh, our uh, sewage system, right, from all sorts of all of these different exposures, all of these different routes, our clothes, our, you know, all of the different um, things we've been talking about, the containers. Um, something we didn't discuss is that they treat plastic containers used for storing uh, ingredients for a lot of different things with fluorine to make them harder. So they end up becoming fluorinated. Um, so you end up with fluorinated compounds in the sewage treatment system. And it seems like in a sort of regenerative eco ecology, you would want to take uh, nutrient rich material and return it to becoming nutrients for the things that we eat. Um, and so bio, the spreading of biosolids, which is sort of the way it gets, it's basically spreading sewage, um, treated sewage um, has been a common practice, but um, we have not paid attention to the contaminants in there, right? We have not looked at, I think PFAS is just the tip of the iceberg, frankly, um, and we're not really testing for other things at this point. Um, but it is one of those cases where when you put toxics into a system, you have to expect that they're going to show up in all of the endpoints of that system, right? So they're show, it shows up in our drinking water because our water has been contaminated and it shows up in those biosolids. Um, and because PFAS are forever chemicals, once they get into the soil, they, they can be taken up by the plants, they can be then eaten, which then get eaten by animals. Um, and it does have a, a, a detectable levels and levels that we should not be eating. Um, so it, it basically toxifies the entire system. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate and frankly heartbreaking to think about farmers who thought they were doing something good for the earth and end up doing something that has poisoned their land. You can only imagine what an organic farmer who puts in hours and years and you know blood, sweat, and tears to to earn those organic standards to realize that uh, when they were getting their biosolids that it was coming with toxic chemicals. So it sounds like another thing, yet another thing that we need legislation on our standards. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple of questions about consumer products. Um, how do we know if the garments we're buying contain PFAS? Are there any non-stick cookware products that aren't made with manufactured with PFAS? Should we throw out all Teflon coated consumer products? <laughs> I mean, I don't know where we put them, but I don't think continuing to cook with, uh, with non-stick Teflon cookware makes sense. And I mean, the thing that they will tell you is that, oh, it's perfectly safe until it gets scratched. Well, any of you, you've all had nonstick cookware, you know that's 30 seconds after you get the product, right? Like you use it three times and it's got a scratch, which basically means that what you're buying is disposable cookware. So I, I would urge folks to consider uh, more known, durable, long lasting uh, materials like glass, like stainless steel and like um, uh, cast iron as alternatives. These are things that last generations, right? You could have your grandma's cast iron skillet um, and it really is durable and lasts. And if you treat it well, it can develop a nonstick coating. So I think that we need to be moving away from looking for sort of a nonstick coating solution um, in that sector. I mean, honestly, uh, when it comes to, to, to things like clothing, if you see that it is labeled as stain resistant, uh, sweat resistant, um, if it is labeled as waterproof and you can't tell a material, like say polyethylene that's making it waterproof, you should assume that it's PFAS because that's what we are seeing. And I will say that even the, the study that um, Assemblywoman Fahey mentioned um, about children's products, they, they actually looked not only at just sort of products that were labeled as um, waterproof, but they looked at them if they had an uh, Ecotex or Ocotex, however you want to pronounce that certification. And a bunch of those green certifications screen out only a small number of PFAS chemicals. 
um, and that they were still detecting other PFAS in those products. So there is uh, a lot, you know, the, the easiest way is to don't buy, don't accept aftermarket uh, treatments for your furniture or your carpet for, to make it waterproof or stain proof. Don't buy clothes that say they're stain proof, just use you know, cleaning methods and accept maybe that you have a little lingering stain if that's the worst case scenario, better than washing PFAS, you know, having PFAS up against your body and washing down the drain. Um, but really fundamentally, and this is Clean and Healthy New York's principle is that no one should be exposed in these ways, right? No one should have to worry about it. You should be able to go to the store and buy a pair of pants without worrying whether or not they contain PFAS or not. And so that's why we work on policy so that everyone equitably, whether they can afford the time to go do the research, whether they can afford the dollars to buy the higher marked up product, that they're getting safe and healthy products. And so um, I hope folks will be inspired to take action um, and encourage the legislature to move because that's what protects all of us. And fundamentally, and fundamentally we need the change systemically to make sure that we're not creating more waste, we're not creating more water pollution at the source, we're not creating more people who are exposed as workers, we're actually solving the problem. And so I would encourage folks to um, put your efforts there to the greatest extent that you can. So uh, thank you. That's probably a good way for us to wrap up. I know there are a few more questions. Somebody's asking about dental floss. Um, if you go to Sierra Club's, Rockland Sierra Club's, uh, website, web page, you'll find um, a list of products, a fact sheet from Environmental work, Working Group that lists safe alternatives. But ultimately what Bobby was just saying, and we're just gonna wrap up, is that really we need, you know, we need to stop, the, turn off the spigot and, and legislation is being introduced uh, um, this, this spring right now, this week, by Assemblyman uh, Zabrowski and, and I believe by State Senator um, Reichland Melnick and some has already been introduced by Assemblywoman uh, Pat Fahey to, to begin the process to ban these categories. So, you know, so really we hope that people will take action to support them. So we wanted to wrap up now with um, a little bit of wrap up about actions that you can take. Um, Bobby, did you want to do this part? I know you have some slides that you pre you prepared about the actions that people can take. I, I dropped the phone numbers into the link and Rob also into the chat and Rob also dropped the action alert. And what we're going to do is we're going to send out an email afterwards so that you can have that those links okay. easily accessible and share them with your friends okay. to take action. Um, because I know that we've, we've this has run longer than we anticipated, but hopefully folks have been finding the conversation valuable. We right, appreciate right. your staying. And I know there was somebody in the audience who wanted to talk about private wells, but I think we're kind of running out of time. And I feel like we did address the issue somewhat, but we can, I think we can follow up with more questions afterwards. Basically, there, there is a real problem with private wells. Rob, did you want to just say one word about like one like sentence or two about private wells? Because I know you've been working on. Uh, yeah, I, I can mention. Peggy, you know, yeah. Yeah, that there that that's really the next frontier, I think, on the PFAS and water issue. There are no protections for private well owners right now for these chemicals. And that's got to change. Uh, there has to be help with testing. There has to be help with treatment. Uh, and the state is going to have to play a really key role, both in those testing and treatment requirements, but also the funding, because we don't want costs falling on low-income rural New Yorkers uh, who might face a financial burden from having to clean up something in their water that they didn't even put in there in the first place. Uh, so there's statewide legislation that we're working on to require private well testing during home sales and by landlords every so often. It doesn't yet include PFAS, but the hope is we can get that in there. Um, and that's, you know, I think one piece of addressing the private well issue going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, if I may. Yes, um, please. To the person that asked either about dental floss or garments or buying products, um, as a family here where we actively look for PFAS free things because our levels are so high, um, the sad news is you probably won't know because most of it is not labeled. That's a whole issue. Um, so th the best you can do is research again through some of the sites that were mentioned to find brands that don't have it, but 
basically you won't know because they're not labeled. So that's again, the push for legislation to get this, just get the stuff out mm -hmm. um, and how important it is to back, back, back our legislators and, and advocate for getting this stuff just away from us. Well said, well said. Um, again, the sites that uh, Laureen had mentioned earlier were uh, uh, consumer reports. And then I mentioned um, environmental working group. We do have some resources listed on rocklandsierraclub.org, but um, both of those organizations have posted fact sheets or research in looking into specific products. So I, I wanna, out of consideration, I wanna end here because I know that we're running over. I wanna thank our panelists and everybody for attending. We will be following up with actions that you can take and any questions that were not answered so far, we will try to address also. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. And, and I hope this was very helpful and informative for you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. All. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>